Compound Nation. It is Tuesday, 5 p.m. in the East. That means we're doing another edition of What Are Your Thoughts? I'm your host, Downtown Josh Brown, here with uh, my co-host, Michael Batnick, as always. Michael, say hello. Hello, hello. The, the, hello, the hello, chat hello. is going the chat is going wild right now. What's what are going we going on? off about? Everyone has spring fever, Mike. We we uh we sprung back. What, how does the clock work? Spring back, fall forward. We spring, spring back, back, fall forward. Horizontal and diagonal pull. No, what is it backwards? I don't know how it works. You fall back and you spring ahead. Come on now. Spring ahead. Anyway, it's beautiful out. It's like uh it's like a summer day. Um I feel alive. I feel reinvigorated. Yeah. Uh and markets are listen, the stocks are stocking, the coins are coining. Everything is uh everything's going nuts right now. I think everyone has spring fever. So that's that's kind of cool. I uh my my I had a suitcase where the zipper broke. So I put it in my wife's trunk so she would go get the zipper fixed. I forgot where does one that get the zip where do you get the zipper fixed? The she goes to like mat? a luggage store. That's not the thing though. The thing is I always put the air tag into the luggage. So she's getting notifications that she's on the move and she's being tracked and she, for, for like two days. She's like, what is going on? Did somebody put an air tag on me? Why am I getting notifications that I'm being tracked? Turns out everywhere she goes, the luggage tag is pinging uh, and she's getting taxed. So it's uh, very disturbing, but we just figured out what's going on. And uh, Sprinkles, I apologize if you're listening. All right. Uh, we have a sponsor tonight. It's Rocket Money. Michael, do you want to tell the audience what Rocket Money is all about? Do you want to tell the audience what you walked into before we came on camera? You guys were talking about, low-key, you were talking about <laughs> Rocket Money before we even came in to, to do the show live. You guys are really I, excited about it. I was doing the commercial before the commercial because there's nothing better when I, than when I get an email that says refund detected. You know what I got today? J. Mm. Crew. Is that still a thing? My wife yes. returned close to J. Crew. And refund detected. I wouldn't have even known. I wouldn't have even known. Yeah. And you're getting that through Rocket Money? I love it. So when I log on, I see, you see like your recurring bills. So, yeah. okay, next week I'm paying Verizon, Netflix, Disney Plus, whatever it is. Like it's all right there. You can see past transactions. You can see your income versus your spending. Are you in a deficit? I don't know. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. You, it, yeah. you, can, you can do it all. It's super easy. And there's not like a million tags and where it's a huge pain in the ass. They do it all for you. I love it. One of the main things we talk about Rocket Money about, you know, that, that Rocket Money does is it helps you cancel subscriptions that you no longer want. But what you're saying is even if you're not in the market for canceling anything that day, just keeping it, just keeping track and being notified of everything that's going on, that in and of itself, if you never cancel anything for the next three months, just to have that uh, vision of what's happening is worthwhile. Yeah, I don't cancel anything. I just just right. let it roll. You double. Like you tell. It. You tell Rocket Money add more add more subscriptions. All yeah. right, uh, stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and track your spending by going to RocketMoney.com/compound. That's RocketMoney.com/compound. We had a CPI report today. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked so much about inflation. I just think we should uh, touch on it. What were your What was your What was your reaction to the numbers? We're going to talk about this later, but I don't know. I don't know how the Fed cuts right now, and I know they're not going to. I know the market doesn't think they're going to either. They won't. But Michael McDonough tweeted, "An increasing segment of the U.S. CPI index is growing at an annualized rate exceeding four percent. Subcomponents constituting over sixty-three percent of the total CPI index are climbing at a faster rate than four percent. So it's not great. Uh, it's not great. It's not. I mean, I'm, I'm not to be alarmist, but what's it's, the it's, segment? That's all. Sir, my understanding is that's mostly services. I didn't dive dive deep into it today, but Jason Furman also tweeted two months ago, the six month annualized core PCE inflation rate was one point nine percent. We'll get the February data in two weeks, but looking like this this same metric will be up two point eight or two point nine percent. So. Yeah. Is there like reason to be alarmed? I don't think so. But you know, the the progress that we've made seems to have been seems, seems to have stalled out a little bit. Okay. What's keeping the market from panicking is that it's happening in the context of a really strong economy, where uh, the the core components of inflation like not terrible. So like you're not getting the acceleration higher. You're just not the, the you're not getting that last mile to come down. That's like the hardest part. And you're just you're not getting it. So that's what's keeping here. Here's core up 3.8 percent, overall up 3.2. Um, 
Looks like energy was up 2.3% month over month. But like Airfare is up 36 After all of the cumulative price increases that we've seen over the last three years or whatever, like prices are still creeping higher. They, they are. Yeah. And one of the things that you're hearing um, from the political debates is the cumulative uh, inflation. Like since 2020, what is Joe Biden's cumulative inflation? And it's a real number. I think it's greater than 20 percent. And that's yeah, a real number, and that's, dude. And that's average. So there are things that are up much more than that in that same period of time. Not to Grocery. assign blame, not to assign blame to anyone, but like that's the reality. And people groceries are up a lot more than than regular than the regular basket. Yeah. So I think this is like the biggest observation, the the most worthwhile observation to have, which is that people care more about the cumulative over the last few years than they care about this month versus last month. But on Wall Street, we're focused on this month versus last month because we think that guides policy. Um, but politically, people care way more just about like the overall situation they're in, and they're not tracking this month versus last month. I was having this conversation with Ben today, now that he's here to defend himself, but and not that it was such a disagreement. Ben seems to think that inflation, we could declare victory, and I wasn't so sure. But the point that I was making, and that he, this he agrees with, people are pissed off about the cumulative price increases. There was a, vi a TikTok video that went viral about some dude complaining about the groceries. It's really expensive compared to what it used to be. And yeah. if you look at like, well, look at real wages and the data, it doesn't fucking Nobody matter. Gives a shit. Nobody it gives doesn't a shit. matter. Data doesn't sway anything. It's how people feel and they're pissed off. And I get it. It sucks. It's not fun. I was out at dinner Saturday night. I went, I went back to Union, by the way, uh, it's good. In, it's good. in Eisenhower it's good. Park. So I was at dinner and I was with a guy, he owns a business and he's like, listen, all the guys I talk to, they think this is the worst economy they've ever seen. So I said, well, all the guys you talk to like are high school educated at best. And you know, they're not like, they're like focused on what's annoying them that day. And they'll, you know, like they're, they're, they're not focused on like the actual situation that they're in. They're just focused on how pissed off they are in general. He's like, yeah, that's yeah, probably true. Yeah, yeah. Like they're, they're guys that own businesses and they think, they, they're, they're saying their, their sales are softer. I said softer than what, like 2021? Because that's a fantasy land that's never coming back. He's like, yeah, and it's just everything's a pain in the ass. I'm like, all right, well, I agree. But here's the thing. Uh, the economy has never been larger. 401k balances have never been greater. Um, home prices have rebounded. Everyone's working. Everyone has gotten a wage. Wage growth is now outpacing the growth of, of CPI. Like and all of that, the all worst that, economy you've ever seen. Well, that's really? absurd. But, but all of all of the things that you just mentioned are superseded by the fact that every single week people go to the grocery store and it's so much fucking money. Yeah. No. Listen, so. it's it's tough, which is why presidents don't win uh, when inflation happens. Presidents lose. Yeah. So we we know that for we we know that historically these types of inflation spikes don't happen very often. And when they do, they upset whoever's in the White House because that's yeah. who's going to get blamed. So anyway, Sim so like the, really so simple the, as that. So the Fed's not going in May. We have these uh, we have these rate cut probabilities. Let's let's do this is May. Um, so this is how am I? What are we? 20 percent probability of how? Why am I reading this this way? So. All right. So this all the way on the right shit chart. This is, not a shit, this is not a shit chart. This is a shit understanding of the chart. The 525 to 550 is where we currently are. Correct. That's the current target. It says it right there. There is an 83% implied probability based on Fed funds futures that, that there will be happens. no cut. Yeah. Yes. Okay, got it. Let's do, do we have, uh, do we have June? And so June, there's a, it's obviously uh, better than likely, better odds than not. Now I should say this changes every single day. But I, and this I, is, I guess what I wanted to, I wanted to see like, did this change? based on the reading today? And the answer is not really. Well, that part of the chart we don't have, we don't have in here. So if somebody was right. supposed to do that, then yeah, shut up. Uh, so, so like, there really wasn't that big of a reaction today because I don't think anyone was going into the number thinking like rate cut was a slam dunk. Um, you know what? It'd be, it'd be funny Got if you right here. It. So CME, so looking at May, 86% chance a week ago, it was only at 80. A month ago, it was only at... A month ago, there was only a 39% chance that they didn't cut. Only right. a 39% chance. Now it's 86. So things change pretty quickly. Things change over the course of the month. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, you keep getting hotter than expected. Like, that's that's where we're going to be. And guess what? People talk about, like, what's the risk? 
uh, what if the next move is 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 uh, a hike, not a cut? Now, I'm not saying that it will be, but it's not impossible. Uh, it would it would be terrifying to the stock market. That would, would that would that would kill the market. You will get you will get your correction right then and there, and there yep. might even be a circuit. If if the Fed if the Fed even hints at rate hike, <laughs> right, you'll get your you'll get your circuit breaker that day. I don't know about Listen, that, but you'll I'm get honest. You'll, you'll get a VIX thirty. Yeah. yeah, and that'll be viable. But yeah. that's that's yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, you might cure inflation single handedly, cr- crash the market. You want to worry about inflation the next day. All right, uh, I want to just go through this Wall Street Journal piece by Greg Zuckerman, who I think is one of the best uh, writers at the Journal. And we know we know Greg. When Greg did his book, he came on the show, and he's talking about all of the people, very influential people, who warned of an economic disaster that never ended up happening. And you know, it, it looks at Ray Dalio and it looks at Jamie Dimon. So in mid 2022, Dimon was saying hurricane about to hit the U.S. economy. It Back could be a minor hatches. one, or it could be Superstorm Sandy. He literally said, Ooh. which is crazy to say that in New York. Uh, Ray Dalio called for predicted a debt crisis and a perfect storm of economic pain. Jeff Gunlock, David Rosenberg, who's been bearish for 15 years. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's the usual suspects, but it's also like very respected people in high positions. And some of them are now saying, I got it wrong. Dalio said, uh, I was bearish. I got it wrong. Okay, great. Diamond said, I would have thought some of the fiscal stimulus would have worn out by, so I, I highly respect people for saying like, Hey, that's how I felt at the time turned out not to be true. Um, I think that that's something that. Maybe there's not enough of, but the bigger point I wanted to run by you, I feel like one of the things that I've learned in this industry, you're bet you're almost always better off um, picking between one of these two things if you want to get into the market punditry game, or you want to become an influential person in finance. And I know them all. This is what I would say: the number one way is to just always be bullish. Some would call this the Tom Lee. Um, take your lumps during the bear markets, take the ridicule, take the shit people throw at you on Twitter, understand that it's only going to be for three months or nine months and never waver. Don't give an inch and eventually you will win. And Tom has made people a ton of money over the last 15 years because he has not wavered and he has endured those, those corrections that made him look temporarily foolish. He's been vindicated and he's been right in the long run. Um, I think that's also a, a Belsky approach. A lot of people that I respect very highly, they have cracked the code. They figured this out. Um, method two is also a fairly attractive way to go. Um, speak bearishly, but behind the scenes, stay fully invested. Like come on TV, talk about the coming economic storm and then load your book up with uh, NVIDIA calls. Like, that works too. That's a way that you could do this. You don't get blown out of the game uh, when the market is rallying, but during the corrections, you get to smugly remind people how cautious you are. Uh, Do you agree with that take broadly? Like, do you see both of those two avenues as being highly effective? I do, but I wonder how many people that you just described in the latter bucket don't actually believe what they're saying and actually are heavy in cash and maybe most. even outright short. You think no. most are like- Well, that's the third way. This is the dumbest thing I... All right. These are what the dumbasses do. Vocally bearish all the time and actually invested that way. <laughs> There's not a lot of people in that category because they're gone already. They're out of the business. You can't really do that. You can't like be pounding the table bearish and then manage other people's money that way? You, no, no, no. You'll, you'll be well, redeemed no. into zero. Well, not on a bull market, you can't. There's one guy doing that. It's, it's yeah. John Hussman. $300 million dollars left. Right. That's down from billions. You, so you can't really do that. So the people who are bearish all the time and investing bearishly at all times, they win once every 20 years. And they lose the rest of the 19 yeah. years. And you, but you, you can't actually know, stay in business that way. We know that right once like really right once you you can make a career at, on tv out of that well they have because there's still guys going on tv who have been wrong for 15 years um and they don't really get penalized but my argument is those guys aren't really investing that way do you understand what i'm saying 
I understand. Well, they're definitely not investing in anybody's money that way. No shit. They're writing newsletters yeah. because right. if you were investing other people's money that way, you're already gone. There's no way. There's no way you have any AUM left if you've been bearish since 2008 or 9 or 10. How? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, literally, your accounts will go to zero if you actually are investing based on the things that you're saying. So I think if you want to be in this game and you want to be influential and you want to be successful on the street, pick one of those two lanes that I described. Lane one, I'm bullish all the time no matter what and live it and invest that way and take your lumps. Or lane two, I'm always cautious. Can I see how you're investing your portfolio? Oh, what a surprise. You're all in S&P 500. That's, by the way, that's Professor well, Schiller. Yeah. That's, Bob, that's Bob Schiller's yeah. uh, approach, and it works. But there's, another, there's a third lane. I, we're not in either of those lanes. Like, we're not. Uh, I, I think we're closer, I to lane, we're closer to lane one than lane two. I invest as if I'm always bullish, but I'm not always bullish. Like, my portfolio is invested as if stocks will go up forever because that's what I believe. I mean, I don't really believe that, but you know what I mean. But I'm measured. I'm, like, not always bullish by any stretch of the imagination. I did, a, I did a thing for the LA Times during, I forget which panic, maybe 2018, uh, prior, to, prior to COVID. So whatever was the panic before then. And it ended up being the cover of the business section. And, it, and the, the gist of the article was, pray to God for volatility. Because if you're a young person with barely any money, that's the only way you're going to build stakes in these companies and get a foothold in what the stock market has to offer. Like, What's wrong with you? The market's down and you're rooting for it to go up and you have $10,000 invested? Yeah. Like, are you crazy? So I think I'm closer to lane one and I'm pretty sure I'll see Dow 100,000 in my lifetime, uh, you know, beyond that. And uh, that's, that's, that's how I feel. Do I feel that, that at times the market gets ahead of itself? All the time. And sometimes that's right, sometimes it's wrong. Um, but I think I'm, if somebody had to categorize me, they'd probably put me in lane but one. But you're neither because the last two episodes you said that the Nasdaq top for the quarter. Yeah, still think so, so. We're not. But I'm saying we're not. But we're not in either of those lanes. We're in our own lane. All right, let's move on. Um, so Spiva every year. This is an S and P. Uh, I don't know. Com, uh, report. It's an S and P report. Mm. Uh, and what they do is they look at the short term and long term performance of mutual funds, both equity and fixed income. And what they showed us this year in terms of how large cap domestic funds did versus the S&P, it basically always looks the same. It's really hard. So 60% underperformed the S&P 500 this year. Sometimes they do better. Sometimes like 2021, it's impossible. They do, they do much worse. But I have to say, credit to them. Next chart, please. The fact that 40% were able to outperform when fewer stocks have outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 12 months and basically ever, at least since 1990. It sounds think it's, like a big accomplishment. I almost think it's miraculous that 40% yeah. outperformed. What, well, how do you think they did it? You think they overweighted they, uh, the MAG-7 stocks? Th that was the only way. There's no other way to do this, right? Last year, the only way to outperform the index was to be overweight mega cap tech. So to the 40% that did so, credit to them. Okay, so... Uh, so so the nasdaq last year was up 50 percent. how much was nvidia up in calendar 23 180. i was gonna say 200 yeah monster so over like overweight microsoft nvidia uh amd apple yeah you could definitely get that you could definitely get that done the question is can you do it can you do it this year well can you do it next year the answer is no next chart please <laughs> uh so all large cap funds 93% of them have underperformed the benchmark over the last 20 years. And this is the ones I should mention. This is the ones that even, uh, that Hold were on. obviously Mike, can you back up. Can you say that? Can you say that again? You're saying 93% of the funds that were around 20 years ago, 93%. Nope. That's not what I'm saying. 93% of funds that were around 20 years ago and still exist today underperformed the S and P 500. Uh, and this doesn't just buy the seven percent. What's what's the problem? Right. The, and this doesn't include all of the ones that cease to exist. Now, it's enough. I don't. We don't need to like pound on the active industry. We we know it's hard. It's really hard. Um, it, it is really hard. And this isn't even the hard part. The hardest part is that there's no persistence of performance. So if like if you identify five or six large cap managers that crushed the market last year. 
you have as good a chance of them crushing the market this year as you do of them underperforming and being in the bottom quartile. Like they're, the probabilistically, it's, it's yeah, it's worse. Prob probabilistically, like there's just no way to know that whatever you just saw from an active manager can be repeated. The other part is predicting wait, wait, the stick, future. Wait, 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 stick with that. So in terms of the ones that actually do win, I remember the study very clearly because it's just mind blowing. So Vanguard did the study of the of the funds that did outperform over the long term, and it's I don't know if it's ten percent. I mean, according to this, it's only six percent. Seventy two percent of the winners underperformed for at, for at least three consecutive years. Seventy two percent of the winners underperformed for three consecutive years, which is a lifetime. These funds, for the most part, are evaluated every single year. So the idea that you're going to be able to stick with something that's down three years in a row versus the benchmark because you you know that they're going to perform, it's just, it's nonsense. Well, the, this is what makes it really hard for a financial advisor because when if you build a portfolio of active managers and your value add in the eyes of the client are, I'm managing the managers and I'll fire the underperformers and I'll allocate more to the best performers, um, that actually doesn't work because a really great long-term track record is built by underperforming for long stretches of time. And so how do you know when a manager has just lost his magic or her magic versus Can't. is just going through a temporary period of underperformance? So if you're answering for that to clients and you've positioned yourself as like, I'm the, the water diviner and I tell you like, who's gonna be the best fixed income manager this year? It's, it's, it's like a it's like a, a delusion of a dream. It's I don't even know how yeah, that's how good, do you that's do good. that? That's a you good know, description. That's it's tough. tough. All right. Very let's tough. move on. Everyone's talking about this now, like out of nowhere. I don't know who started it. Is Nvidia the new Cisco? And the big question is, is it nineteen ninety five? If so, you wanna buy Cisco? Or is it two thousand? And if so, you're seeing the top of of Cisco. So if you think there's an analog there where NVIDIA and Cisco are acting like they did, then this question really matters to you. Do you agree with that? I do. And can I tell you something? I'm like, wait, I think I wrote about this. I said, is NVIDIA the next Cisco as the title of a blog post in August 2023? Yeah, you were right. <laughs> you were right. It, it became, that's what it became. Um, anyway, this is the new thing. So just to bring people up to speed, Cisco became the largest stock in, in the world temporarily in uh, two, 2000 was the peak. And basically, um, networking. What were they doing? What, what, yeah, what were they selling? Same thing they sell now. Uh, tel it's, it's telecom equipment. It's networking. It's the building of the internet. So the investor class said, I don't really care if Lycos is going to be a bigger search engine than Yahoo. LOL. Neither ended up mattering. The real play here is the picks and shovels, and Cisco makes the equipment that every single telecom company, government, internet company will need um, in order to connect to the World Wide Web, which is a term we used to use. And that thesis was right. It was the Michael Jordan of the NASDAQ. I swear to God, that stock used to go up 10% a day, five days in a row for nine months at a time. It was just, it was a one decision stock, and it acted exactly the way nvidia acts right now you had to be in cisco you might as well quit your job if you were in portfolio management and you weren't in it and then one day for no reason on no news it went in reverse and the stock still still has not gotten back to the levels it traded at 24 years ago wow. and they've grown earnings since they've grown revenue they've released innovative products wait hang on so, so not only did they grow revenue, I think O'Shaughnessy did a report on this. I think it was them. It grew revenue 20% a year for the next 15 years or something like that. Dude, this was not a piece of shit company. The yeah. problem is we pulled forward so much demand into that stock valuation. Rob Arnott did a, a great thing on Cisco. You might be thinking of that, um, where he, he measured the valuation per employee. And I think he determined that every employee was worth like $70 million or something at the peak. Anyway, uh, the problem was not with Cisco, the company. The problem was with the hopes and dreams that we pinned on it as being the picks and shovel play for the internet. And we pulled forward 20 years and counting worth of demand into like one year of performance. 
Um, and that's the NVIDIA comparison. Are we doing that again, only substitute networking equipment with GPUs? Okay, all right, so that's the story. Warren Pies at 314 Research did a piece comparing Cisco and NVIDIA in a couple of ways. You wanna throw this first chart up, John? Mike, you wanna tell us what we're looking at here? So this is the price index to a certain level. And yeah, NVIDIA has had a good run, but nothing really like Look at what this Cisco shit. did. Yeah, Cisco Look was another this. totally different. So if you weren't there, and Mike, I know, I know you were like in elementary school. Um, if you weren't there, you could look at a chart like this, but you can't feel this chart. Like you weren't, you weren't trading this stock and you don't remember the frenzy around it. And 20 years from now, when you tell somebody about Inv anybody, you talk about NVIDIA to somebody who just got in started investing over the last few years, they won't be able to uh, feel the NVIDIA mania that we're all living through. And so there's like a part of market history that I feel like you're required to live through to have a really strong opinion on it. So I don't talk a ton of shit about 1987. There are people that do. I wasn't there. So I didn't feel it. I read about it, right? Okay. Um, what if we use percentage share of market cap instead of price? Dun, dun, okay. dun. Uh, oh, now we're talking. Now yeah. we're talking, right? <laughs> what, do, what do you think? So at the peak, March 2000, Cisco was 4.5% of the S&P 500's market cap. NVIDIA is already... 5.1 and i think it went up today uh and counting so is this a chart crime to like all of a sudden shift the the metrics or is this a no. legitimate way to think about it no I don't, I don't think it's a chart crime i also don't think it's super meaningful how about that so why isn't it super meaningful to you it's just two lines on a chart and yeah but it's I, saying I don't, but it's saying something it it's it's could put that back up it's showing that Cisco's percentage of the market cap of the S&P came really, went from nothing up to 5%. And NVIDIA has had a similar run. So, he, okay, fine. Here's what it says. What is the significance, though, of percent of market cap? It tells a story about an investor mania Correct. and a dominance of a yeah. component of an index. Like, there I guess is, there's information the, there. The only thing is there's no, there's no reason... And then, like, just using that chart, there's no reason to think that NVIDIA has to follow Cisco's path. That's all I'm saying. We agree. Yeah. I, it's totally legit, but it's not devoid of meaning. You have one stock that becomes this important to the whole stock market almost it's overnight. In, it's in rarefied air. This type, of, this type of roller coaster ride has happened only a very handful of times in the history of the stock market. All right. Give me this table, John. So back to the, is it 1995, is it 2000, is it 2024? Uh, anyone who wants can screen grab this, obviously. This comes from uh, our friend Warren Pies at the amazing 314 Research. And, you know, on a lot of these metrics, Mike, and I want to hear which ones stand out to you, there's a huge similarity to the year 2000, Cisco, um, on, on the S&P and on the tech sector. And then in a lot of ways, there are huge disparities. So the one that I want to just bring up first, on March 24th, 2000, which was the peak of the dot-com bubble, technology was 35.38% of the S&P 500. And right now it's 29.95%. And by the way, I don't know if that includes all of the giant MAG7 names that are not even included in the tech sector. Uh, but, you know, either, like, like Meta is not a tech stock. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm guessing that for this purposes, for that purposes, it is, it is right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, does, do any of these things jump out to you as like table back on table too back close on. to too close for comfort? Forget yes. 95, just the 2000 yeah. no, 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 to no. 2024. So, so let's look at the peak. So the trailing 12 month returns from the five biggest stocks lines up pretty nicely. 91% versus 87%. Now here's the, but here's, here's a major, major wow. difference. Here's a major difference. The prior two-year return from 2000 was, I'm making this up, 150%, okay? If you look at the last two years, these, these five stocks are basically flat because 2023 was a really, I'm sorry, 2022 was a really bad year for tech stocks and they bottomed on December 30th. 
So if you pull it back two years, the story looks completely different. You understand? Yeah. Uh, this is not great. Um, in, 2000, in March of 2000, earnings per share growth for the whole S&P was 11%, and it's negative right now. So it's, it's crazy that we're having the 2000 comparison. One thing about the year 2000 is we were coasting on uh, pretty decent profit growth from 99 into 2000. Um, there was a spending frenzy around Y2K, and a lot of that growth would disappear later on in 2000 because people didn't need to spend on all this stuff after the planes didn't fall out of the sky. I don't, I don't know if a lot of people really understand what was going on. Spike Jones did a commercial for Nike, uh, a New Year's commercial in 1999. It was a jogger who was running through his neighborhood, and it's a funny commercial. The planes are literally falling out of the sky. It was a Y2K hysteria-themed Nike commercial, and it was like, just do it like because the world is coming to an end, basically. But that pull forward in demand, you had tons of CapEx because governments and corporations around the world were just loading up on computer equipment, worried that the old stuff they had was going to crash when the clock turned over um, from 99 to 2000. That sounds a lot like the GPU story. Totally. Like, buy this shit now or else you're going to get locked out. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of similarities with that story. And we mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, Meta, Microsoft, whoever, they're an enormous customer of NVIDIA. I think, the, I think five companies make up 60% of the spending. So the question is, like, how many chips does Met, Meta need? You know what I mean? Like, obviously, they're ramping up the shit out of their reels and all of their AI stuff. Like, they're really ramping. But are they going to spend the same in the next 24 months as they did over the last 24 months? It's hard to say that they're going to. I'll do, you, I'll do you one better. A lot of the chips that are being bought now have to be NVIDIA GPUs because it's for training. And you need like literally the best to train LLMs, um, to, 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 to train AI. Um, but then later, once you've got your, your LLM and you've got your thing built, it becomes about inferencing. And if you look at the types of chips that uh, Amazon says they're building and Alphabet and Microsoft, they're building their own inferencing chips and they may not be an H100 quality or caliber chip, but they'll be good enough. So it's not even how many GPUs total, it's how many training GPUs really need to continue to be purchased. Keep in mind that a lot of these AI things are just being given away for free right now. So my question is, like, if you look at the chart and if you pull up a monthly candlestick chart of NVIDIA, it's it's insanity, right? It's absolutely yeah. wild. And this sort of this sort of price action in a stock like, yeah, it gives you it gives you reason for concern. It, 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 it makes it makes things feel uh, unstable. Um, however, you can't not talk about the fundamentals like is NVIDIA expensive? Yeah. Is it crazy expensive? I don't know. Like if earnings estimates are way off, then maybe. But it's trading at what? 25 times uh it's trading at 25 times 2025 20, earnings estimates like that's not a, that's not that much now if earnings are fall way short then yeah this thing's gonna face plant but it's not it's not ludicrous the stock All is right. ludicrous the earnings estimates speaking of ludicrous let's let's quickly do this bespoke chart okay so this is different this is this is what's different like right this second versus yeah. the dot-com bubble in 2021 you had piece of shit companies and what i mean by that is Companies that, that are trading at over 10 times sales. So not piece of shit companies. I shouldn't say that. Super expensive companies. And let's be honest, most of them were junky. You had a ton of them doubling year over year. That's not the case right this second. Well, we had that. We had an echo bubble in 21. We did that in, yeah, we did that in 2021. We're not doing it right. We're not doing it today. All right. That's a fair point. Uh, what's this next one from Carl Quintanilla? Uh, just in terms of... Uh, the enthusiasm or lack thereof for stocks. So Savita Zubermanian at Bank of America said, equity allocations today are almost precisely where they were in 1995, far mm. from 1999's euphoria. So is this 95 or is this 2000? It's probably somewhere in between. John Authors wrote about Cisco versus NVIDIA at Bloomberg, and it was a really well done article. And he, he is making the case that there is enough similarity here for us to be somewhat concerned. Um, but... The differences are, are more fascinating. So you just mentioned, like, look at what's going on with earnings. That's the point that he's making. 
He's saying actually NVIDIA's multiple peaked last summer the same way Cisco's did at the time of the dot-com bubble bursting. But what's strange is that NVIDIA's price earnings has since come down as much as Cisco's valuation did 24 years ago. Yeah, the stock is cheaper today than it was two years right. ago. So or a year using ago. valuation as a yardstick, this is authors. There was indeed a Cisco-style melt-up in NVIDIA, but it's over. And now the valuation is actually crashing because the fundamentals are exploding. So let's do this first chart. This is wow, earnings wow. multiple. Okay, earnings multiple. So if you looked at this chart, this is just showing the multiple itself. Um, NVIDIA had a, what is that? A 200 times earnings multiple, uh, I guess, what is that, days ago on the bottom? Days, yeah, days from the peak, yeah. Okay, so three years ago, NVIDIA was at its, at its max uh, multiple, it looks like, right? A thousand days-ish? Okay, yeah. um, so that multiple has collapsed, but the stock price keeps going higher because the earnings are, are going up. Let's do this next one. John says, is PE the right metric? If we compare the two picks and shovels manufacturers on the basis of their multiple sales, we get a different picture. Look familiar? Judged by sales multiples, NVIDIA's rally looks a lot like Cisco's in 2000. All right, this is a, this is a fair point, no? Um, okay, what about margins? Uh, we have margins. Do we have that? Yep. All right, this is nuts. I mean, come on. <laughs> this is crazy. NVIDIA's profit margins are now 50%. They were below 20%. Um, they were below 20%. How many quarters back is that, would you say? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. doesn't matter. Uh, this is a company that, as they grow sales, their profits are up, or, or, or their percentage profit margins are actually expanding, which is obviously absolutely absurd. Um, and it's something that we did not see with, with Cisco. And I think that's a fairly uh, important point. Last one. Let me ask you this. Wait, before, hold on. Let oh, me ask you this. If, if, if in two years, NVIDIA's price is roughly where it is today, plus or minus 10%, what would you say the likelihood odds are that it experienced a crash? In other words, can it go sideways and digest or does there need to be a crash? You I think it's know. binary? Yeah, because I think, I think that most of the money in this is index money or momentum money. Like I, I, I don't think it's got, I don't think it's been a big stock long enough to have like a long-term shareholder base. Does that make sense to you? Yes, like it does. It's only been a gigantic stock for like 18 months. So it's not like Apple to me. I don't think you'll, you'll I, I think it has to either be going up or it's going down. So when I, okay, how much of the stock do you think is froth versus fundamentally based? Do you think it's 80-20, is it 50-50? I think it's like the story and the fundamentals lining up. It's like impossible not to buy this stock. But there, but there's there's froth here. Do we agree on that? Yeah, I mean, this no, thing is crazy. Course. Yeah. So is of it eighty percent? Of, you know where the froth is? I don't even know if the, the froth is necessarily in the stock stock side. It's the derivatives. Like it trades four billion dollars worth of options a day. Somebody told yeah. me. Yeah. That, like th there's nothing fundamental about any of that. Yeah. And don't tell me that's people protecting themselves because because I'm not stupid. I didn't fall off the turnip truck. Um, that's not fundamental activity. That's, that's the froth. Yeah. Uh, last one. Can Nvidia sales growth possibly be sustained? John authors no. asks, no, no. Is, no look at no, it's no, a vertical no. line. No, it's, it's just, it, it can't. Um, oh, we do have, we did the margin one already. All right. So look, it's not, it doesn't have to exactly be Cisco in order for us to agree that there are some elements to this that are Cisco esque. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. some that aren't. And that's why, yeah. and that's why this, is, this is difficult. It's not that's exactly the same, so but there's, there's parallels for sure. And I, and I own it. So anybody that's like telling me I'm, I'm like trying to spread uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, I'm not. I'm just being realistic about I'm, I'm, what's I'm going honestly, on with this stock. I'm surprised, I'm surprised that you haven't sold, just given that it's I've gone been selling on the way up, up but I don't want to yeah. sell all of it. Yeah. I took 20% I took, uh, of my position off recently. I took 25% of it off uh, in May. And you got it all back three year. days later. <laughs> I, it does, it, you, you take 20% off and the stock goes up 20% the next day. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's, it, honestly, it's, it's like a beanstalk. Um, 
We're anyway, the, j just last last thing. Just yeah. looking at this chart, it's so extended from its 200 day. It could fall back to 530, whatever, like in without it even being without its without its long term uptrend being even remotely damaged. Yeah, like that's how extended it is. All right, now here is one of the things that make investing really hard. At the same time, that's going on. The rest of the market is actually looking really good. I really wish good. it were so simple where we could say, nope, it's an AI bubble. And as soon as it bursts, everybody's screwed. Not really. If your story is that there's only six or seven magnificent stocks holding up the whole market, you need to get a new story because that is not true and hasn't been true for a while. Banks, uh, industrials, materials, financials, they're all at 52 right. week highs. So this is the Wall Street Journal today. This is Apple, which is in gray, dropping precipitously. The blue line is the S&P, and the pink line is right behind it, equal weighted S&P. And uh, I thought this is a really well done uh, article as well. Almost one-fifth of the stocks in the S&P 500 hit new 52-week highs on a recent day, the largest share since May of 2021, according to Bespoke. Um, the S and P is up 33% in the last 12 months and many, many stocks are too. And that is what's very different from what tech stocks were doing in March of 2000. You want to pop this chart up, Mike, and tell us what this is. Pop it up. So we've spoken about this di negative divergence a million times as the S and P continued its ascent, fewer and fewer stocks were participating until the whole thing came undone. As you see on the I bottom pane, it. as you see in the bottom pane, that's just not the story today. So that's one thing that is very different but, uh, between now and then. And guess what? If this, start, if this rally starts to peter out and it's only the tech stocks and everything else rolling over, we'll tell you, that just hasn't happened. I told you this story where I was uh, a retail broker in late 99 or early 2000 and every single kid in the room was pitching a tech stock uh, to, to like new accounts and every single kid in the room had a book of clients and they were a hundred percent tech. And I remember vividly people saying myself included, why would I ever buy a non tech stock again? The entire rest of the market was red, mm -hmm. like selling off, losing market cap every day, steel stocks, apparel stocks, healthcare, you name it. And then you had maybe, maybe there were 500 of them. 500 tech stocks that were green every single day. And it was just like, I mean, Josh, I how ever quickly, bother? How quickly would you have gotten fired if you sold Qualcomm and bought uh, uh, Alcoa? It would be unthinkable. You wouldn't even want to do that. It would be unthinkable. And no one was doing that. And when you look at mutual fund flows from that era, everybody I was piling imagine. into like the Munder net net fund and Janus. There were mutual fund families whose sole line of business was we do growth tech. And they were sucking in all, there were no ETFs. They yeah. were sucking in 100% plus of the flows. And that was what, bu uh, Buffett was on the uh, cover, maybe it was Fortune. It was or, What's Wrong Warren was the headline. Yeah, Warren Buffett lost his touch. Holy shit, what a, what a bell ring. I mean, who knew? What yeah. a bell, yeah. what a bell. All right, uh, all right next. Keep it moving, okay. Um, so, earlier in the show we spoke about inflation. Um, not, I don't want to say re-accelerating, but it's, it stopped going down. Let's put it that way. So Belsky's got a chart showing the financial market indicator. Now, in fairness, I'm sure, I'm sure the stock market is a fairly large component of this financial market indicator. But how do they cut? Like, how do they cut right now with financial? Now, the housing market is obviously, you know, anything but, but loose. But everything else is red hot. So what is the reason to cut? That's what I'm saying. What are you accomplishing with a cut? I think the I only, don't know. The, the, I'm not the a only, macro guy, but the only I, explicable thing is like if you don't have to if you don't have to be in restrictive territory, then why? Well, I'll tell you why. What about if you lose it and create another bubble in two seconds? Yeah, uh, Neil Dutta, who knows more about this stuff than both of us combined, put out a note today after the CPI report came out, and I didn't read the whole thing, but the 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 highlight was. The Fed should just get on with it. And based on the Taylor rule, you would be cutting. I don't, does the Fed really give a shit about the Taylor rule? I don't know, uh, but, but here, here's one thing they don't give a shit about. 
So you can look at the stock market and say, how could they cut now? Guess what? History shows they don't care about the stock market. Warren Pies has a great chart. He says one error that many have made the cyclists to believe the Fed worries about the equity rally. History shows that they do not. Seven out of eight initial Fed rate cuts came with the stock market within 12% of all-time highs. That, that surprised me. Uh, yeah, I don't think I would have guessed that. Seven out of eight initial Fed rate cuts came with the stock market within 12 uh, tw oh, it's twelve percent. I guess that's a pretty wide range. But whatever. But still. So yeah, the stock market. Right. The Fed doesn't wait for the stock market to start going down to cut. They're supposed to not be focused on that. They're supposed to be focused on unemployment and uh, and inflation and stable prices. Neither one of those are giving you a signal that a cut is warranted. Now, if you want to say money is tighter than it needs to be given the absolute level of inflation, yeah, that's true. But is any is any economic activity not taking place because full, rates are too restrictive? I can't think of anything. Full employment, credit spread super tight, stock market everywhere at all time highs, and they're going to cut. Yeah, and and to the people screaming about inflation and oh, but but home prices. What do you think is going to happen if they start cutting rates? Mortgage rate will will price that in same day, and then home prices are going back up. How does that help? Oh, you get a cheaper mortgage, but the, but the home price goes up 10%? Like, how does that help anybody? Right. So I'm not really sure what the objective would be if, if we're, we're, like, trying to get six, six cuts done this year. It's just no one's screaming out for that to happen. That I Yeah, can... so I'm with you. I, I, again, I don't pretend to know enough about macro stuff to yeah. know. But oh, like... you know who wants rate cuts? New York Community Bank. Correct. Real estate guys. <laughs> Real estate guys, cry, cry harder. All right, uh, what what else are we gonna do here? Oh, the Mag Seven I'm bench. Good. Okay, uh, how do you find the next Magnificent Seven? Obviously, I don't know, Josh. <laughs> well, I'll how tell you. How do you do it? Obviously, there's a qualitative component to this that requires actually understanding the companies and their brand power, and you know things that don't show up necessarily. In a, in a in a balance sheet or an income statement, but it's probably not the worst way to start to look at um, the financial strength of these companies and use that as like a, a sifter, so to speak. So I asked Sean, what would be like the bench for the Magnificent Seven? And we came up with a few metrics that we wanted to break this down by. And uh, I kind of like the list that we came up with. Uh, let's Let's pop this up. So basically, we started with uh, market cap. Uh, we wanted we wanted strong stocks. We wanted uh, companies that we wanted companies that had revenue growth. Five year revenue growth was was important to this exercise. And yeah, like you could look at this and 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 say, all right, should uh, should Pfizer really be considered here? Well, the answer is yes. They have the they have the growth, and they have the size, and they have the potential total addressable market where they could be like much bigger and much more dominant. You could say the same for pretty much all these names. Um, is there anything on here that you just know for a fact could never be a mag seven stock? Not me. Uh, but I will say, no, I don't know that. Uh, all of these stocks look exceptional with the exception of team. Like, these stocks are acting great because the fundamentals are great and it's a good market. Look at the five-year annualized growth. This is the thing that knocked out every other stock, by the way. This was the, the, the end of the exercise. And when you asked for 25% plus five-year annualized growth, we ended up with nine stocks, I think. So that was like the knockout factor. But look, I mean... I'm mad that I didn't follow you into Uber. I, I said at the time, like, good trade, and I, I just not, I didn't pull the trigger. It's not too late. It's not too late. I, know, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I'm not going to buy it, but I agree with you, which, I, which means you know it's going higher. The stock's trading wonderfully. Massive gap up after earnings. Didn't even get to the bottom of the wick, and it's just gone sideways. So this thing look, this is trading like an absolute champ. You could, here's I, you the could thing, buy here's what I would Here's what I would do with not this Not financial list. advice. Here's what I would do with this list. I would look at the business these companies are in, and I would just ask, like, is this – could this be something that would justify a trillion dollar market cap someday in the future? Not now, but is the business that this company, now when I look at Uber, I think, I think 
transporting people and things and freight and delivering things, yes, that could, that's a TAM globally big enough that could support a trillion dollar market cap. That doesn't mean they'll get Not there. Not today, right, of course. Doesn't mean it's tomorrow. Doesn't yeah. mean they won't fuck up the execution. No, in 10 years, yeah, it's feasible. It's feasible. Another competitor could come along. Like, I'm just saying like that TAM could justify a mag seven sized market cap. So we're not, that, that's the exercise that I think people should do if they're trying to find a stock that at least has the potential. Uh, one thing that's interesting, I asked Sean, take the existing MAG-7, go back five years, so 20, 2018 would be the start, and uh, which of the existing MAG-7 names today would have even made the cut? And it turns out a 20% five-year annual revenue growth screen would have screened out Apple and Microsoft at the end of 2018. That's kind of interesting, right? Hmm. Um, all right, let's do these charts really quickly. Here's AMD. I'm showing you price up top. Great job, Sean. And uh, market cap below. So $200 stock, $320 billion in market cap. This is like an, incre this is an incredible chart. Next. Perfect. Full disclosure, I'm long Uber. I think it's consolidating, my, my opinion, uh, before the next uh, move higher. It's only $161 billion market cap. Yeah, but what's the share price? Well, in dollars? <laughs> 77. Uh, next, ServiceNow. Do you know what ServiceNow um, does, Mike? AI. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same category as like uh, Workday and yeah. Salesforce. Enterprise sales, whatever, whatever. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who cares? It's going uh, higher. 160 billion market cap, bigger than I thought it was. Next, here's Fiserv. Holy shit. This is one of the fastest growing companies fundamentally, as JC would say, uh, 88 billion market cap. That is not a lot considering the growth going on here. Uh, this stock looks like they're doing AI. Um, next, here's CrowdStrike, full disclosure, I'm long. Best performing name in the cybersecurity group. Uh, George Kurtz, friend of the show, not to brag. Uh, everything he said they were prioritizing and working on. When I listened to the last conference call, it just seemed like a, a laundry list of things they're executing on. And the TAM is expanding because they're doing a lot more than just uh, cyber. Uh, so it's a uh, $79 billion market cap. Here's Palantir. I, I missed this one, dude. Did you ever trade this? Did you ever buy nope. this? Nope. Do you, do you know anything about it or not really? Uh, defense shit, cyber stuff, AOI. I don't know. AOI. $54 billion market cap, $24 stock. Not at a, not at a new high. What do uh, they do? It was higher in 21. What do they do? I'm sorry. I'm losing your connection. I, I would explain it, but I, I can't. It's data. It's whatever. Yeah, sure. It's, you know. Atlassian. This is a uh, team, T-E-A-M. I think it's named for its uh, it's named for its flagship product, basically. Uh, but this is fifty five billion dollar market cap, nowhere near the twenty twenty one high. Twenty twenty one high looks like it was four fifty. It's a two hundred dollar stock. Um, but if you think this thing is making a comeback, this is where you want to start getting interested, I guess. Wow, fifty five billion dollars for a wine company. That's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that that's where I would start. Am I leaving I like anything it. out on? Is that a what? What else would you put in in these metrics to try to find the next Mag Seven name? What would you do? Um, what are we missing? I'd probably throw like a, I don't know, like an ROE or margin screen on top of it. Okay. To I don't know, but you did, get, it's great. It's great to get less to get less companies in there or different. But you don't. Companies. Need, but you don't need to because this screen this screened out almost everything, right? This is like a screen of nine companies, so I think you're good. Yeah, we ended up with nine. That's we good. kicked out. We kicked out uh, DoorDash. And or you could like relax. Thing. You could like relax. You could dial down the twenty five percent because that's like you know that's insane. How much money would I raise if I launched this ETF, the the Mag Seven Bench ETF, and we do ten? Oh, we do twenty stocks, and we equal weight them, and we rebalance once. We reconstitute once every six months. How much money million, would I raise? Fifty million in the first thirty days. Five hundred million. Well, when? Of what period First of time? year, 500 million. Yeah. As long as the market, as, lo 
<laughs> what? Go ahead. As long as the market cooperates, yeah, that's yeah. how it's fair. I would be yeah. screaming about this thing if it started to outperform. Yeah. I would be insufferable. Oh, you'd, I was about to say, you'd be impossible. <sighs> you, a lot of my friends would never speak to me again. I'd be that impossible. All right, well, we're not going to do it. Uh, you're, you're, you're last. All right. What do you got? Okay. Um, we spoke about this on the show with, with, uh, with Todd Sohn. Jim Bianco created a chart. We're talking about NVIDIA, the double levered one, NVDL. This, the cumulative fund flows, it's just hilarious. And listen, this is what investors do. So not to be, not, in to, not entirely unexpected. So you've got this going on. You've got the dun, 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 magazine cover, Barron's over the weekend, bet on the bull. For those, uh, for those listening, the Barron's magazine cover this weekend, it's a white cover with two bull horns bursting through the front of it. And it says bet on the bull in bold letters. So and, listen, you, you, you see this, you see the yeah. silly behavior, you see stocks up 16 in the last 19 weeks. And understandably so, it raises alarm bells. Listen, it does for me too. I'm not going to lie. Like, I don't love seeing this. However, we have fine people on the internet that actually look at the data and say, is this meaningful? Does this matter? Is this in and of itself a sell signal? And the answer is, it's not. Not saying that this one won't be, but just when you see a, a, a bullish cover in a bull market, it's not always the end of the bull market. So sentiment trader tweeted, so many are pointing to this economist cover as a contrary indicator because the economists do one too. How high can markets go? I've tracked every cover since 1998 and graded each one that indicated a clear forecast of a tradable market. Their batting average is 47%. Over the next year, bullish covers led to a 60% win rate and a 9% average return. So, okay, what else do you need to know? Not great and not terrible. But a few cherry-picked examples does not a strategy make. Our friend Ryan Dietrich uh, added here, a lot of worry about a bull cover on Barron's this weekend, but note that Barron's has had many bullish covers and been very right over the years. In May 2013, I remember this one, in May 2013, when stocks were just breaking out to new all-time highs, they said this, trust me, most are still bearish after the great financial crisis. So in 2013, at, at down 15,000, this bull is room to run and people were losing their fucking minds. And guess what? It's been pretty good since then. Double. So. More than doubled. So again, I'm not saying that markets aren't frothy over here or due for a pullback. We are definitely due for a pullback, but don't make decisions based on market, on magazine indicators. They're not Magazine indicators. indicators are great for being a snarky asshole on Twitter. Could you imagine you're sitting like face to face with somebody who's managing your retirement money and his investment strategy is fucking magazine covers? Like you call yourself a professional, you son of a bitch. This is what you're doing. You're looking at looking at cartoons of bulls and and tell and telling me to take take some off the table because there's a fucking yeah. bull on on yeah. the cover of a magazine now now listen it shows you where sentiment is yeah things are frothy we know we don't need a magazine to know that right we know things are yeah. frothy yeah we could just look yeah. at we could just look at stock price we don't need to know what an editor called an illustrator for for their for their latest cover story yeah uh, if you've been fading magazine covers uh <laughs> Since 2009, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Similarly, put this Granite Shares thing back up. Uh, long NVIDIA double. So we had FA, we had FAS before you people were even born. I was trading. We had a, I know you were. We had a triple. <laughs> we had a triple bank ETF. Bear and, and bull. Bear and bull. F A C. Bear and bull. And we had a triple Russell 2000 ETF before you were even born. So don't you show me double NVIDIA. Kiss my ass with this. All right, out. Chart off. Um, who's making the case? Me or you? I forgot. I'm, I'm, I'm making the case. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Looking, I'm just looking at FAS. Is that thing still? Let's see. $2.2 .2 billion <laughs> in FAS. That's the bull. Yeah, the, bear only, the bear only has $160 million in assets. So it's a bull market. <laughs> it's a bull market. All right, I'm, I'm breaking my own rules because you got to know when to break them, right? Go you got to know when to break them. Of course. The young man knows the rules. The bald man knows when to break him. Am I right? Yes, I like that. All right, so charts on, please. I These are two stocks that I bought recently. I think I bought Hershey two or two weeks ago, maybe, and I bought Bristol Myers, eh, maybe around the same Buying time. Buying below the 200 day? I said I wasn't going to do it. I said I wasn't going to do it. But I also said, I also said that if I was going to buy a stock that was in a downtrend, I was only going to buy a stock that I was willing to hold if I was wrong. And these are two stocks that I'm willing to hold if I'm wrong. The story with Hershey is very simple. This is an Ozempic beatdown, and it's also a, co uh, a chocolate prices, cocoa prices at like four. <laughs> You're going to start tracking cocoa prices at like, now. At like 400 years high, <laughs> year highs. Guess what? Hershey ain't going anywhere. <laughs> Technically, the stock looks good. I feel good about the purchase. And Bristol Myers, quite frankly, I don't know what they do, but 
I'm sure they're not going anywhere either. And I see a double bottom and I bought the stock and I'm sticking with it. I don't really know what they do. You really made the case beautifully. Uh, Dude, I'm here to make money. I think you'll make money. I think, I'm here to I, make think money. Make, I think you'll make money in both, actually. I don't hate it. It's, it's not for me, but I, I think You fucking though, bought Pfizer. What do you mean it's not for you? You're literally in the same trade. It is for you. You're no, in the worst the version same. of this. It's not the same, though. It's not the Don't same tell trade. me your fundamental nonsense. Wait, it's Hershey and Pfizer thing. were the same trade? No, Bristol Myers and Fire. Same uh, exact thing. Uh, it's not for right. me. You're in the same trade. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, I do agree with you that they both are in a similar, uh, both have similar looking charts. Bristol Myers looks better than Pfizer. At least it's yeah. picking its head up off the mat. Yeah. Um, Pfizer's yeah. still laying on the mat covered in blood. There's, a, right. there's, a, there's a gap at 56. That son of a bitch is getting filled. I have a mystery chart for you. Let's do it. All right. Let's put this up. Ooh. Now we're talking. Yeah. Is this Bristol so, Myers? No, dude. <laughs> I'm kidding. Doesn't Come look on. too dissimilar. All right. Are you giving me a fucking clue? Yeah. I just, I wrote down some clues. Let me just, uh, let me see what I wrote that I wanted to do here. There's an audience, you know. No, I All know. Right. All right. All right. So, so what's up, guys? Uh, here's what's all right. Here's here's what's in, here's what's interesting. Yeah, chart off. Let me see this asshole. Here's Go what's ahead. interesting. Here's what's interesting about this, and I have a few charts that I'm going to pop up after. This is a Left for Dead technology stock. I don't even know if you would consider it tech anymore, but in its Ooh. day, it was one of the hottest technology stocks. Um, there have been activists in this stock that have walked away and given up. It's just it's one of the longest running internet companies um and i i recently bought some and i think technically there's something really interesting happening here so i'd like you guess please no 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 i need more it's it's a it's an I internet told you, internet, internet company you give the long running clues. what do you want right, so oh, oh it's long what you running oh it's long running okay that helps tell me what you would want to hear about it what would be a clue can you give what, me what? anything can you give me anything I, I, th I felt like I gave you. It's a long-term publicly traded internet company. How many of those are there? Long How many of those term. really are there? That's what I mean by long-running. It's been publicly traded for 20 years, okay? And it's an internet company. There's not 50 of those, dude. It's an internet company. What does that mean? What do they do? They, it's like a website. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not even messing with you. Uh, All right. We have some guesses in the chat. Somebody said Netscape. That's really funny. <laughs> Somebody said AOL, also funny. It's like that oh. era, though. Uh, okay. No, don't type it in to see if you're right before you guess. That's uh, not how I'm, we play this game. Obviously, what are you I'm typing? The, obviously, I'm looking at the charts. That's how I play. No, you have to. You have to just guess. That's you how I play. Take one guess. Without. All right, I know it's all right. You know what? No, how about this? I'm not even gonna guess. I'm not even gonna guess. Pathetic. But I would have gotten this. With what I've given you, I would have gotten this. It's a it's right. an internet company that's been around for twenty years. All right. Okay. When Very I do the helpful. reveal, when I do the reveal, Very try not helpful. to jump out the window. Come on, dude. This wasn't that hard. This wasn't that hard. Now think about the clues I gave you. eBay. Look at what? it. Yeah, it's an internet. Look company. at it. That's no. Yeah. It's a. I said it's one of the oldest internet companies. Okay. All right. There's all not right. that many of these. Right. I like I like the chart. I like the chart. Put it back up. What do you What do you think, dude? What's I up? like it. I like it. This is an earnings. This is an earnings beat. Um, the stock took a breather today. Uh, I don't really see any resistance here. This, this is like uh, this is to me. This is this is ten times earnings. All right, sir. So, how are the fundamentals? Terrible. I mean, they're fine. They're not great. They're not bad. They are paying a dividend, two percent yield. They're buying back stock. They're growing at one percent a year. You know what happened to eBay? Honestly, Facebook markets came came along. And just sucked up all the users, so that's why they, that's why the stock does that's why the company can't grow, because their new competitor is Meta, and Facebook users are buying and selling each other's junk on on the site instead of going to eBay. Um, but eBay does really well in some interesting categories like sneakers and luxury goods, like Louis Vuitton stuff and watches, and it's got. It's got some really big markets that they uh, do really well in. I'll, so, I'll say, I think the gap at forty four, no offense, is going to get filled. Maybe I have a stop loss in on this. Yeah. Um, next chart. This is eBay versus the Qs over. I guess this is the last year. So 
it 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 did nothing it did nothing it did nothing and now it seems to want to play um do we have one more oh throw this up yeah so this is just one year if i if i took the ticker off this again and showed you this stock you would say buy it you would like if i didn't i didn't tell you what it is i didn't tell you what they do and i said what would you do here buy or sell you would say this thing's going right maybe i wouldn't say sell it all right last chart I'm showing you a golden cross, sir. This is the 50-day moving average crossing above the 200-day, uh, literally yesterday. All right, literally so, meaningless, but okay. You don't like golden crosses? What's the matter with not you? A, you too not good a for golden, golden cross. cross? I'm just, you know, I'm a data guy. The data doesn't confirm. Nothing. Hey, there. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow is Wednesday, which means another all-new episode of Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben coming your way on Thursday. We will do. Uh, ask the Compound with Ben and Duncan. On Friday, Mike and I are back. The Compound and Friends with another amazing guest. And Jill on Money this Saturday. We have a full slate. Uh, make sure you keep hitting the like button. Make sure you leave us comments and reviews and all those good things. And we'll see you very soon.